Hey, good morning. Welcome back. Nice to see you again. I wasn't able to provide a video recording of the first class because I wasn't familiar with the system and it, it doesn't really help us much. The quality of the video is not what you would expect. The, the, the angle is, is just on the podium. I don't want to be tied to the computer. So I'm trying to produce a recording as I've done with my classes during the last semester using my iPad Pro uh, with an angle that covers almost two thirds of the blackboard myself. Once I pull down the screen, the video will be visible, the video will be in high resolution and I can simply download it from the iPad or directly from the iPad. I can upload it to YouTube and then provide a link. Of course, it, it, it will be a private video. No one will be able to find it just by searching or just by going to my YouTube channel. Only you with the link would be able to see the video. And at the end of the semester, the videos would be removed, would be made private. Today, I'm going to continue with my introduction of some core concepts in this class in reference to the notion of what is Machiavellianism, how is the term Machiavellian interpreted, and how it could be otherwise interpreted if we look more closely at Machiavelli's ideology and the quote-unquote system that he uh, illustrated in this original, creative, and somewhat odd little book that is The Prince. We will do that with the help of a famous example borrowed from game theory called The Prisoner's Dilemma which we will try to analyze in a Machiavellian framework. And then I will introduce a few more concepts. If there is time, I will also go back to the example of the garage is full and someone ignoring the sign to enter the garage, committing a minor act of cheating and examining that from a Machiavellian point of view, because that example extends then to all kinds of behaviors that some might call Machiavellian or with a term that is synonym. And, and I'll provide some synonyms later. Uh, however, before we leave the classroom, I want also to take some time to show you the class website and discuss the syllabus, the great components, something that I couldn't do on Monday. So later I'll pull down the screen. The computer is already uh, in, in the website of the class and we will proceed from there, okay? So when we consider the term Machiavellian, which has become one of the most common, most popular terms. If you look in the database of the New York Times, if you look, if you Google the term Machiavellian, if you go inside Google Books and you put Machiavellian, you will find a very large number of Hits, a very large number of articles, documents, pages of books where the term Machiavellian is used. However, we can say that there are two ways to translate the term Machiavellian. The most popular way to interpret Machiavellian is 
thinking of adjectives to replace it, such as conniving, duplicitous, and especially manipulative. To the point where you find Machiavellian widely used also in the field of psychology or in the field of romantic relationships in reference to, of course, relationships that are not healthy, balanced, respectful of each other. There is enough light, but I want the board to be clear enough even in the video. The other way, of course, would be in a selective environment such as this classroom within academia. Machiavellian could be defined as an idea an attitude, a behavior reflective of Machiavelli's own system. As I said before, system is way too modern a term and doesn't really reflect what you will find in the prints because even though there is a clear structure, and in fact, every chapter of the prints has a title that represents a summary of the chapter itself and the direction that the narrative is taken in that particular chapter, there is no system per se. If you want to understand the system that is included in the book, you really have to work on it and do a lot of interpretive work, interpretive analysis in order to extrapolate what we would call a system or any kind of intellectual algorithm out of the pages of the book. And what is on the surface of the book is some recommendations that are often contradictory and a lot of examples which in themselves created the impression that we still retain in popular culture that Machiavelli was all about evil practices, practicing evil in the context of the political game. So keep that in mind and let's talk about the prisoner's dilemma. As I said before, the prisoner's dilemma belongs to the tradition of the doctrine called game theory, which has been the most successful political and military model of the post-war era after World War II, right? If you take any kind of crisis during the Cold War, if you take some of the wars fought during that era, including the Vietnam War, game theory, was constantly being used by strategists and consultants who were working as experts for the Pentagon. Yes, please. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, does is game theory like a product of the Rand Institute, where um, the Prisoner's Dilemma came out of, or the Rand Corporation? Is that what it's, I think that's what it's called? Is it? Oh, I cannot answer that oh, question. Oh, uh, the Rand uh, Corporation. I, I would need about more information. I haven't investigated the historical roots 
of game theory. My understanding it comes out of math experts um, such as Nash, for example. Nash wrote in his early 20s an article that was considered the foundation of game theory and the economy. I couldn't add any more details. Maybe you know more than I do. And you, you can tell us if you want. Oh, or, no, I, you, or you told me more than I knew there. <laughs> Stony Brook has the uh, center for game theory. I'm sorry? Stony Brook has the center for game theory. Of course. No, no, no. It's, it's vital. Anytime you want to predict the outcome of a complex situation, examining all possible variations. Okay? And this is a simplified context that allows a student of game theory to understand the basic principles. Okay? So let's start with, oh, by the way, besides game theory, you can also find this applied to the study of psychology with reference to the theme of cooperative or collaborative behavior as opposed to any kind of individualism, everyone for himself. That is to say, do we as humans have an innate tendency or an acquired tendency to collaborate with each other, cooperate with each other, including strangers, or we do that only when subjected to certain circumstances, to certain rules, and to the enforcement of those rules. That is to say, we behave in a collaborative way if we are in a classroom, if we are on the road, if we are in a restaurant, but if you remove any kind of rules or boundaries, then you might find yourself fighting each other, okay? To obtain whatever you want. That's another issue that can be applied to the study of this example. So, in this story, we have two criminals. We call them A and B, okay? You can give them name if you want. Call them Andy and Bob. They commit some kind of robbery or theft. On the way out, they are arrested by the police. However, the police cannot pin the robbery on them. There is no evidence to convict them, even though the police is pretty much certain that these two guys are responsible for the robbery or the theft, whatever you want to imagine the situation to be. There is still something that the police can do to them. They can be charged with some kind of misdemeanor. You can imagine, let's say one of them has a gun or even something simpler such as a big knife or tools that could be considered the kind of equipment you could only use for a robbery but not, there is no evidence for the bigger charge of robbery or theft. Imagine that they're being taken to a police station, right? And then they're placed in two different rooms, isolated from each other, and they're being interrogated separately. It is also essential, in my view, although you don't find that in every um, illustration of this example, of the context of the example, from our point of view, for the purpose of defining what Machiavellian behavior is or is not, in my view, it is essential to say that A and B, although they participated in this, let's call it a robbery, together, they have no history, they're not friends, they don't know each other well, right? Consider this the typical situation of a movie where 
a gang of criminals is brought together, but they uh, don't know much about each other. They're there for the job and they're supposed to split the loot and, uh, and, and leave. The two are being interrogated by a police officer. And of course, there is the possibility of a deal, right? If one of them will testify that they participated in this robbery, then a deal can be had, okay? However, the conditions of the deal are if A talks about B and B remains silent, then A and D get out free, zero. No, not a single day of jail, okay? Because he was instrumental in getting this con con conviction and that is the part is part of the deal. And B will get six years in prison. Of course, it'll be abbreviated, it'll be actually three years if he behaves, etc. But the conviction will be six years. The opposite clearly is true. I will not put it on the board, or I'll, I'll do it later in a different kind of diagram, which is typical of game theory. If B talks and A stays silent, B gets zero days of prison and A gets a conviction of six years. If A talks and B talks, if they talk on each other pretty much at the same time, then they both get three years. Not much of an advantage there. Finally, if A remains silent and B also remains silent, they don't denounce each other, they don't confess, they don't admit to their involvement, then they get charged with the lesser charges, carrying a gun, carrying a weapon, whatever you imagine that the lesser charge might be, they still get one year, okay? So, of course, the last option would be what we call a collaborative behavior, right? Because pretty much they do the same thing to the mutual advantage, right? And as I said, this can be studied in the context of assessing human behavior and human tendency to not just collaboration, but what we might call, what is being called in the field of psychology and also social studies, reciprocal altruism. That is to say, I don't feel any particular tie. B is not my friend, it's not a relative. So I'm not doing something out of any kind of affection or loving sentiment, but I understand that this would be, for both of us, this last option would be the best option for both, okay? And otherwise, the other possibilities are betray some form of hostility, okay? I'm trying to take an advantage take advantage of the other, and I may succeed in the first case, or we both fail because we both are trying to exploit each other's situation and we end up with three years.
okay? Now, according to game theory, this would be represented in this format, trying to catch the possible combination, all the possible situations, right? So this would be A, this would be B, this is A talking, this is A silent, this is B talking, this is B silent, right? And let's examine all the possible situations. So, whether you examine the first quadrant from A's perspective or from B's perspective, the result is the same. They're both talking, right? So, this would be three years of jail for each one of them. If A stays silent and um, B is talking, that would be six years for A, vice versa, would be zero for, for B, for, for Bob, okay? Because he has been talking and A has been silent. This would be the opposite, zero and six, and this would be where they get one year each, okay? So I'm trying to combine and see all the possibilities. The purpose of this would be, of this matrix, would be to try to predict the outcome of the situation or find the best route towards an acceptable, a positive outcome. Any questions to begin with? I hope my explanation was clear enough, but I can go back and explain either the situation or the quadrant in the classroom notes that you will find on the class website. We will also find a link to the Wikipedia article on this, which is plenty clear and perfectly accurate. And then of course, you can find more if you want to explore on your own and just Google prisoner's dilemma, you will find anything from serious articles to variations in terms of the application of this kind of model. So any questions about the story and the analysis of the story? Any considerations about whether or not this is Machiavellian and in what ways we could call it Machiavellian? Please. Uh, it's I guess it's Machiavellian in the sense that it's commentating that both prisoners are trying to decide would the other one rat it out? How much faith do I have in my accomplice that they won't rat me out? So that they, if they decide they have no faith in them, they'll probably sell the other person out. But they also have to consider if they both sell each other out, they both still get three years. But if uh, they rat the other one out, they get to go free. But if they both stay silent, they both get the minimal one. Yeah. That's about the sum of it. I like the term faith or confidence, you also mentioned yeah, that, so that, that, that you use, right? Them, because it's, it is them. one of the key terms in this kind of situation analyzed from a Machiavellian point of view. After all, don't forget that Machiavelli was a humanist. He lived in the period called the Italian Renaissance and his education was the education of the, a humanist. Right? His, his culture was the authentic form of the humanities. So it, it's a both, uh, whether you use the term faith in each other or confidence in each other, both terms resonate intellectually with the mindset of someone from that period, late 1400s, early 1500s, such as Machiavelli. And in reference to faith, to confidence in the goodness of the human soul, 
you do find plenty of interesting references in the prints, and of course, Machiavelli's uh, position on this is pretty clear. Machiavelli himself says, you cannot have any faith in the goodness of the others. You cannot put your trust into someone else's hands. And, and that is expressed in different ways and in reference to different situations, right? So from this point of view, any one of those two criminals betraying the other would just be a verification of Machiavelli's law that you cannot have faith in humanity in general. And therefore, when it comes to someone who's a stranger to you, someone you don't know, you cannot really trust them, according to him, okay? Feel free to, of course, I'm not here to preach Machiavelli's ideology uh, or, or to, to impose it on you, I'm just here to illustrate it, okay? So feel free to disagree and, and I would like that. From that point of view, I, I want to, to have a positive view of life and society. Any other, yes? What's the better takeaway, don't do crime to strangers? <laughs> well, in life you do a lot of things with strangers, don't you? Yeah, it's unavoidable. Kind of <laughs> but yeah, sure. Yeah. Any other reflections? Anything that comes to mind? And again, feel free to express your personal reactions. Don't try to give me an academic feedback, and, and then. Remain silent if you don't have anything uh, that, that looks uh, intellectually uh, of a higher level, right? Feel free to uh, uh, just apply your, your brain to this kind of situation and, and brainstorm about it. That's what we're trying to, to do. Not test you, not interrogate you, but just trying to bring our collective minds together, trying to work our way into the topic, the ideas of the class. So, one last time, any additional comments on this or questions? Yes? It seems like um, it's almost uh, framing self-interest and collaboration as not necessarily mutually exclusive, but like opposites. And I'm, I'm not sure that they are. I think there is like a huge overlap. I think it's in everybody's self-interest to collaborate, to work with other people, because on a day-to-day -day basis, you have, you exist in an emotional context of other people. And the, I suppose the other thing is, I'm not sure this accounts for every outcome. They could just jailbreak. They could just, like, I mean, they might not succeed, but they might make an attempt there. Well, uh, based on the premise, in its purest form, that is out of, of the question, right? Uh, however, it is what you suggest, an interesting venue for developing uh, the analysis farther. That is to say, some kind of, I don't know if you're familiar with the label of lateral thinking. Edward de Bono was a psychologist from the 1960s and 70s that uh, wrote extensively about that. It would be kind of out-of-the-box solution, right? So you have a puzzle, and uh, if you've done enough puzzle, you're, you train your mind not to be captured, not to be trapped within the frame of the game and trying to find something else such as, why not get out of jail? Why not uh, uh, try to uh, attack the police officer and uh, take the gun from him? Of course, police officers don't take a gun to an integration room for that very purpose, and, and then trying to uh, get out uh, of there. But, but we can do a lot creatively going that route. My idea with it is that half the time, the other person is going to talk. So you can probably be anxious, like they're gonna be plotting against you, to the point where you yourself might want to talk, because if you stay silent, you're just gonna get six years no matter what. So you can have that anxiety with you, which is what Absolutely, you absolutely. But again, you're in a blind spot, right? You cannot communicate with the other person, 
and, and that is a, an absolute premise of this, and you don't know the other person, right? Of course, again, you, the, you, you may think of more creative solutions to try and convey some kind of message by lying to the policeman, by manipulating the policeman, and hoping that the policeman, uh, the police officer, the detective will fall for it and ask pointed question to the other one that will convey the message and the other person should understand that message. Yes. Um, yeah, I believe they, they both are talking to three years because in theory is saying um, this is what you can expect in the knowledge that you have, what decision will you make, and it lays that out. And they they can they know they expect, but they know the knowledge that they have that they might that the other guy might talk might not, so they're going to choose the, the safest route and say you probably will talk. Um, I'm going to talk. As well. But then after all, we're talking about criminals, so yeah. why not go yeah. go the route of <laughs> yeah. right? right. It, it's still a criminal. I don't care about you, and and I'd rather have zero or play my way. I don't want to go to prison, so I'd rather uh, bet, yeah. gamble, and, and bet my life. Okay, but I'll stop the discussion here. Take a piece of paper, because you are my prisoners. <laughs> so take a piece of paper, take it out, because those pages will be collected. If you don't want to waste one, you can break one in two and, and share it with the next person. Okay? And you know each other, right? You're in this class, you can see each other, so you can communicate even non verbally. Some of you may be friends with the person next, sitting next to you. However, we can still play the game because I will collect, I will ask you to deposit the pages here on the table. And then I will just randomly pick two, because you don't know each other. So you are A, but you don't know who B is among all the others. And we'll see. Okay? So you just have to write T or S on your piece of paper and your first name and the initial of your last name. You have 10 seconds from now. I don't want you to think about it. First name, initial, and then T or S. Talk or stay silent. And then fold the page and bring it to the front of the class. Put it here on the table. So, come on. Okay, that's everyone. Okay. And, and of course, I'll read your names. If you can please raise your hand when you hear your name. If I see two with the same name, I'll read the initial. If I uh, mispronounce your name, please correct me, okay? So I have Edmund, who's Edmund? Okay. Yeah. And Ed Edmund is, what do you write? Oh, I said talk. Talk, Instead. Edmund is talk. Okay, mm -hmm. let's see what is the accomplice has decided to do Alison. Yes, what did you write? Stay silent. Oh. Stay silent. Right, so, what happens to you, Alison? Um, I say that he is. Okay. Say he is. okay, and no years. Zero. Okay, mm -hmm. six years for you, zero for you. Of course, this is meaningless to you, right? It's just a fictional game. My ideal setup for this game would be to attach to the result of this assignments. Zero assignments, or let's say copy in pen six chapters of the prints and bring it to class. Because then it would have some, it would feel more real. Haven't done this. I don't think students would take it well. Of it, course, at the end, I would say it was just a game, a simulation. You don't have to 
do a little bit. Uh, so. Better to do more in the line. But uh, <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a panopticon. So thing keep in mind, if you can please keep in mind, or actually, can you write down your uh, uh, penance? Zero for Allison six because at the end we want to make a count of the zeros, the threes, and uh, the, the the ones and the sixes. Okay, done that. Can I proceed? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. What do we have here? Okay, we have Kara. Kara. Yes. And what did you decide to do in this situation? Silence. Actually, you wrote T. Talk. I have a T for talk. Oh, that's my last name. <laughs> oh, it's not your last name. Is B your last name? Yeah. Okay. Then you 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 talk. Okay. And we have here Annalisa. Yes. What did you do? Okay. So what happens to you? Both yeah, both three years. So write down three for the final count. So you opted for the collaborative behavior, right? Of course, I don't have the, my reading glasses on, but Sarah, yes. What did you do? Talk. Talk. And we have more. Prismo? Who is, or maybe I, I'm not reading this correctly. Let me get my reading glasses. Maybe it's not a, an H. Matt, is it Matt that I should be reading? Yes? Okay, what did you do, Matt? Stay silent. So, Sarah talked. You stay silent, you get? Okay, and where is Sarah? Yes, you? Zero. Zero, okay, write it down. <clears throat> okay, we have Sharon. Okay, and we have one zoo. Yes, and they both, both talked, okay? Three years each. We have Christine and we have Notion. Christine, okay, and you? I talked, broke down the interrogation room and everything. Okay, and Notion? Yes. You didn't write anything, so we'll call that an S. Stay silent. Okay? Wow. Mm -hmm. So, you get... Um, zero. She stayed silent and you talked. Yes. You get zero? Yes. Six years. Okay, write it down. I'm sorry for writing you out. <laughs> yeah, she wants to avoid the consequences because when she comes out of jail, She'll be looking for you. <laughs> Thomas and Haley. Okay? And you both talked. Okay? So, three years. Write down three. We have Elizabeth. Okay. And Erica. Okay. You both stayed silent. Okay. So you get how, how long a sentence? One year. one year. So write down one. Good collaborative behavior. You got only one year each. We have John and we have Kathleen. Okay. And you both talked. So put down a three. Three year sentence is what you get coming to the end. We have Sharon. Okay. Oh. And a 
I'm not sure I can read this. Uh, it begins with an A. It's called Orchid. Orchid. Yes, I think so. Yeah. And we have two T's. So three is what you get. Three years. And we have DB and we have Nigel. Okay, Nigel stayed silent. You talked. So, zero, six. Veronica and Loris. Louise. Sorry. Loris. So, you talked. Veronica stayed silent. Where is Veronica? Okay. So, zero and six. And we have the last one, Chase. I didn't, know. I didn't put one in. I'm sorry? I didn't put one in. I was in the bathroom. You didn't put one? Yeah. Can you bring it? So we have a finish because we have the last couple of criminals. Okay, so Chase talked, Ben stayed silent. Did I say what Chase did before you wrote it? No. Or? Okay, so you get zero days and Chase gets six years. Let's count the jail sentences. So, zero, one, three, and six. Who got zero? Can you please raise your hand? One, two, three, four, five, right? Did I count everyone? Sorry, can you do it again? Yeah. Yes, five. Who got one year? One, two, that's it. Okay, who got three years? Okay, keep it up until the end. I want to recount it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And who got six? One, two, three, four, five. Is it five, seven, seventeen, twenty-two? Let's see. 3, 6, 10, 13, 16, 18, 20, 23. So someone didn't, or either I miscount, miscounted or someone didn't participate because I have one less, one fewer. Okay? So this kind of reciprocal, duplicitous behavior triumphed in this particular classroom. Of course, the results are being influenced by the very premise, the analysis that I conducted and the comments you made. Usually I get a slightly more even distribution of the results, although you can see, of course, these numbers match each other because they are correlated, right? For any one who gets zero, there is someone who gets six. That's why they're perfectly equal, okay? And so we have 10 person in that kind of situation where one stayed silent and the other talked and 10 person on the reciprocal hostile situation and only two who collaborated. Usually it's a little more it's a few more, but it's, it's nice to, to see this, okay? So before I switch to the computer and show you the website and discuss the syllabus, any conclusions, any additional comments? How do you feel about your jail sentence? And- I feel great about mine. Okay, good. <laughs>
at least someone is happy. And if you have a long stint, think of all the time that you have to study and complete your degrees. You, you might have two majors or a major and a master's during your jail time. So I don't have time to go into depth and analyze this from my own point of view. But the gist of it is that this, in its purest form, is not a Machiavellian game. What is that Machiavelli's ideology is about, in one word, if you had to summarize it in one word, besides saying evil or, or some common association, you might say that Machiavelli's focal point is power, okay? Even without knowing much, can we agree on that? Mm -hmm. Not just because I'm the professor and giving you grades. Mm -hmm. And however, power is a very generic term. And the kind of power that Machiavelli is talking about, we can better describe as control. In order to win, in order to succeed, in order to obtain what you want, in a Machiavellian way, you need to be able to control the outcome. In order to control the outcome, in a situation such as this, coming down to the finer details, you need to control the actual players involved. So you need to control your accomplice, the police detective, or both. Wouldn't you agree? In its purest form, you have, as a player in this game, you have no control over the other. You might try to guess, but guessing is not winning, right? Uh, it's like trying to become a professional poker player without applying any strategy. If you want to make a living in poker, you have to have some formula some approach that will allow you to control the outcome of enough games to make a living, right? Otherwise, if you just play randomly, you will not be able to generate sufficient income. In the purest form, in this situation, no one has control over each other. The police detective has limited control over these two guys. They cannot force a solution that would be advantageous, the best solution for them, and the two criminals cannot really control each other. In order for this to become a Machiavellian game, we have to go the route of some creative solution, or we have to redefine the context of the game. In this limited context, there is no Machiavellian game that can be played. If you explode the context, then we can think of very interesting Machiavellian solutions, which I will discuss on Friday. Um, I don't know if you we're here, all of you, on Monday, but if not, keep in mind that the class website is a wiki that resides on my personal domain at andreafedi.com slash Mac with a K because it feels more evil with a K. <laughs> M A K, or you can just type andreafedi.com slash CLT362 and you will be redirected to this place. This is the format that the class would have on a large screen. However, and the class is open, uh, uh, no login is required. However, 
if you are on a phone or any kind of smaller screen, this is what you will see. A vertical, it resizes based on the size of the screen. So it's very readable and touch friendly and you don't need an app, okay? So what you had on the sidebar before, now the sidebar has become vertical with all the links and the text follows. So this would be the portal. I have an announcement page where I might advertise campus events such as this one next week about climate change. I added that because I work for the Programming Globalization Studies. I informed you that you could find images of the board and a digital recording audio only on the class. So if you go to this page that I showed briefly in class, you see that you find the images I took off the board in case you weren't there. And in here, you find the link to an audio recording. This audio file is stored on Google Drive and you will need an Stony Brook login in order to be able to either listen to the file inside the browser or download the file and then use a different program or a different, dev different device. Oh, by the way, I included in the announcements the news about the new TV series based on the trilogy by Patricia Highsmith on the character of Tom Ripley. You may be familiar with the talented Mr. Ripley. And as you can see, John Markovich and uh, what's his name? Andrew Scott. Scott. Yes. From Sherlock Holmes and Fleabag. Uh, he's playing the part of Tom Ripley, I think. And they were, they're shooting one of the episodes in Venice as we speak. In fact, hmm. the Italian press reported that John Markovich had trouble because his green pass was expired. They couldn't get into the hotel. Huh. <laughs> After that. They're very strict in Italy. It's not the only show he's done in Italy lately. Um, he, he, it's not the only show he's done in Italy lately. He was also the new pope. Yeah. Mm. So I have here a calendar with every week in the semester where you can see our classes, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Down below at 9.15, my office hours, 12 in on Monday and Wednesday in the Melville Library, and my Zoom office hours at 4.30 p.m. every Tuesday and Thursday. And of course, I included the deadlines as well in there. And of course, the lecture notes is where you find the class notes. I haven't populated this beyond I'm revising the program for the class. But again, if you want to review and find more link and more information about uh, today's work on the prisoner's dilemma, you click in here and you find additional notes. And finally, you find in here the syllabus. And I'll go straight. Well, let's try first the textbooks we have two of them. The first one, the Book of the Prince, is something you should bring on a Monday. Not this Monday because we're not there yet. There is an introduction. I'll be talking about the culture of humanism and then also about the life of Machiavelli. But in a couple of weeks, we will begin reading one or two chapters every Monday. So if you can bring it to school on Monday, that first book, that would be fine. And let's review together the final grade. We have 20% for attendance and participation, including just a few short reflections. You have a paper and 
there is a page devoted to the paper basically the paper should focus on a modern book usually a self-help book about Machiavelli trying to analyze the Machiavellian principles found there there is a presentation that is based on the paper which you can do either on zoom or you video record the presentation and then you share it with me and there is a final exam that is based that is just between four and six essay questions and it's based on the readings and the lecture notes and of course uh, later on in the semester i will tell you more show you sample questions from the past etc so that would be the the quick presentation of the wiki of the class